Hello, this is Dr. A again in a clinical chemistry video with uh, introduction to body fluids, electrolytes, and osmolality. All right, so first let's talk about body fluid compartments. So there are um, two compartments, two main compartments, the intravascular compartment and the extravascular compartment. So the intravascular compartment is everything that has vessels like blood vessels, so lymph lymphatic system, the lymph vessels, and the blood um, vessels, so blood. So their lymph and blood are in the fluids that are intravascular. All right, then the extravascular compartment are um, the intracellular fluid, so the fluid inside each and every one of your trillions of cells that you have in your body. Then uh, in the extracellular fluid, like uh, joint fluid, spinal fluid, eyeball fluid, all of that and then the fluid in interstitial spaces so it's the fluid between the cells okay so usually when you take in fluids it's going you're going to absorb it from your GI tract into your blood so it's going to go, move from your gut to your intravascular compartment and then from the intravascular compartment then it's going to distribute it to the extravascular compartment so to your cells and joints and all of that the uh, capillary epithelium of the blood vessels and lymphatic vessels separate the intravascular and the extravascular compartments. So that fluid to move out of the capillary bed has to move past the capillary epithelium. Okay, and then the cell membranes um, separate uh, in, intra and extracellular spaces within your extravascular compartment. So uh, fluid also once it's left the capillary epithelium is going to pass that and it's in the uh, extravascular compartment then it it can be in interstitial space and it has to move across the cell membranes in order for it to get into the cells okay so let's talk about fluid balance and this is going to be really sound really obvious but for water balance intake must equal output so what do we mean by intake it refers to what we eat and drink um, and so fluid Intake is um, eating as part of fluid intake because a lot of the things that you eat have water content to them. All right, output is um, the water or fluid can be used in metabolic processes. So, for example, if you have anything that increases your metabolic processes, so maybe you've been exercising or you know strenuous activity of some sort, or really sick and stuff, you will have an increased use of water, increased output of water, and therefore you might need to uh, increase your intake. Um, obviously, it will also exits out as urine, uh, feces, sweat, and through um, breath because your breath has some humidity to it. And um, just worth noting, if your um, if feces is really like dry, if, you, if the patient or you have constipation, then it's usually a sign of a lack of intake of enough fluids. Um, excess water in the intravascular compartment can shift then to the extravascular compartment uh, and even into the intracellular compartment. Um, and so this is what you see um, when, for example, patients have congestive heart failure and there's just, uh, they're fluid overloaded in some ways and um, the, that fluid is going to move uh, into the, the tissues and all of that and they'll have a lot of times swollen feet and limbs and stuff. Um, dehydration is an excess loss or a decreased intake of fluid. So excess loss could be through sweating, but also uh, maybe through vomiting or diarrhea and uh, or decreased intake. Uh, maybe a patient or a person is chronically dehydrated because they're just not drinking enough water. Um, and regulators of fluid balance are the thirst mechanism, uh, electrolyte gradients uh, across the different membranes and stuff. So your electrolyte content in your cells and plasma, interstitial fluid and all that. Uh, Antidiuretic hormone that is produced or released, produced and released by the posterior pituitary and uh, renal control, of course, of water balance. Um, so th for that also with the renal control in the urine, um, a normal urine should be uh, pretty clear, light yellow to clear. The darker the urine is, um, the more dehydrated the person is. All right, electrolytes. So electrolytes are charged molecules, so they're ions. Uh, and we have to separate our cations and anions. So the positively charged ions are the cations, and that's sodium, um, the main 
cation in plasma and in interstitial fluid and potassium, which is the main one in cells, and then your anions, uh, chloride and bicarb, and they're mostly present in plasma, interstitial fluid, although some bicarb can be found inside the cells also. Uh, electrolytes are essential to many, many processes in your body, really vital. Um, they can regulate volume and you know, fluid volume within your body and osmotic regulation, especially sodium chloride and potassium. They can regulate myocardial rhythm and contractility, so it affects your heart. So that would be uh, your potassium, magnesium, and calcium are the main ones there. But even also the way your muscles, your, other than your heart muscles, contract and stuff. So that, for example, if you're really low on potassium, you'll tend to get muscle cramps. Uh, there are cofactors in enzyme reactions, so um, magnesium, calcium, zinc are all uh, very important cofactors, and they're involved in blood coagulation, like calcium and mag, so very important to the body. Electrolyte imbalances can be life-threatening, and uh, common causes of electrolyte imbalances are vomiting, diarrhea, bleeding, and exudation from burns or other skin injuries. So let's talk briefly about the anion gap. Um, usually your total anions and cations equal each other uh, during homeostasis, and uh, calculating the anion gap is a quick way to assess to see if there's anything amiss. So um, it's pretty easy. You add up all the positively, your positively charged ions, your um, sodium and your potassium, and you subtract your negatively charged ions, your chloride and your bicarb, and that gives you your anion gap. Uh, the role of the anion gap is to estimate any unmeasured anions or cations such as calcium, magnesium, phosphate, sulfates, ketones, and lactate, and then other organic acids. Um, so some of those obviously we can pretty easily um, measure in chemistry, so uh, the calcium, magnesium, and uh, you know we can do ketones, and we can do lactic acids if, if they're ordered and stuff, and we can uh, do a phosphorus level, uh, but maybe sulfates can't be measured. We can measure ketones and stuff, and then some other other, uh, if they've ingested other uh, organic acids and stuff, um, could you know throw this off. An elevated anion gap is seen in ketoacidosis, uremia, uremia or renal failure, uh, ethylene glycol poisoning, uh, which is antifreeze poisoning, lactic acidosis, and hypernatremia. Uh, and if you see a decrease on ion gap, it's usually an instrument error. So let's talk about the colligative properties of solutions. Um, colligative properties are the properties that depend on the ratio of number of the solute particles to the number of solvent molecules in a solution. So basically, how much particles there are within a, a specific liquid. Um, and so this is not based on the identity of the solute or the little particles, just on how much of it is in that solution. Uh, and it's not based on the identity of the solvent either. Um, so examples of colligative property of solutions are um, osmotic pressure, freezing point, boiling point, and vapor pressure. To give you an example, uh, if you had water and you added a bunch of salt to it, then you would have a bunch of salt dissolved in that pure water. Um, and depending on how much salt you put into it, uh, just adding salt is going to raise the os uh, osmotic pressure, and then the more salt you add, the higher the osmotic pressure will raise. It will also drop the freezing point, raise the boiling um, point, and raise the va vapor pressure. So um, the idea of putting sa salt on sidewalks during the winter time it is to drop the freezing point of water so that hopefully uh, the sidewalk um, stays unfrozen. Um, and so that we're just using the colligative properties of solutions to do that. Uh, and interestingly enough, you could do the same with soda uh, or sugar or something like that. We just tend to use salt because it's more abundant and available and easily to, it's easy to just put down. And it would make things sticky. All right, let's talk osmotic pressure and osmolality. So osmosis is the movement of water across a semipermeable membrane. So again, with osmosis, it's molecule. We're tracking molecules of water moving back and forth, and um, they will move back and forth to uh, be equal um, in um, the osmolality on both sides of the membrane. The osmolality is a measure of the number of solute particles per unit of solvents. So um, basically how concentrated a substance is. Uh, really concentrated substances have a high osmolality and very dilute substances or specimens will have a low osmolality. 
And um, this is important because in uh, homeostasis, osmolality is a parameter to which the hypothalamus responds to tell you if you are dehydrated or not, if you're appropriately hydrated. And if you are then dehydrated, it can trigger the sense of thirst. Okay, so the influence of antidiuretic hormone is um, as your hypothalamus senses the osmolality of the blood, and it, if it increases, then it, it will signal the posterior pituitary to release antidiuretic hormone. And <clears throat> the more concentrated your blood is, the more antidiuretic hormone is going to be released. Um, and then what antidiuretic hormone does is it goes to the kidneys and increases the resorption of water only. So it doesn't mess with sodium balance or anything like that. It's simply, uh, it opens up aquaporins um, and the tubules and it can move water <coughs> from the urine back into the blood. And uh, it can even do that in the collecting ducts also, tubules and collecting ducts. And so uh, it concentrates the urine so that it can get more water back into the blood. And of course, antidiuretic hormone uh, will also stimulate the thirst mechanism, which will make you drink water and then hopefully also help correct the problem. So what are the lab procedures for osmolality? Uh, we use osmometers. Uh, they measure osmolality of serum and urine. Um, the most common ones use freezing point depression. The sample is super cool to a temperature below its freezing point. And uh, then a stirring rod causes crystals to form and that releases heat. The heat released by the crystallization raises the temperature to its freezing point. And those temperature changes are uh, monitored and measured by a thermistor and it's converted to milliosmol um, per kilograms. If you want to see actually kind of like that, how it happens, look up a video on like ice bending or water bending um, that is really cool because basically they super cool like water and then you can take a water bottle and just flick it and the whole thing will turn to ice instantly and so you can kind of have a visualization of what's going on there okay and your um, the clinical significance and reference ranges for your osmolality. So for serum, you would expect 275 to 295 milliosmol per kilogram. For urine, 300 to 900 milliosmol per kilogram would be considered normal. Um, osmolality is affected by poisons, such as ethylene glycol poisonings and methanol, um, but also medications and diseases. Any serum value um, less than 240 milliosmol or greater than 320 uh, will, does require immediate intervention by the medical staff. Your hyperosmolar conditions are um, diabetes insipidus um, because it's caused by a deficiency of antidiuretic hormone. Um, the kidneys cannot reabsorb water, which leads to the production of large amount of dilute urine. Uh, and with the loss of all the water through the kidneys, the blood becomes uh, too concentrated or hyperosmotic. Um, the, your hypoosmolar conditions, uh, when excessive amounts of antidiuretic hormone are secreted, then the opposite occurs and you get excess water resorbed and you get uh, a very hypoosmotic blood, very dilute blood and more concentrated urine. So.